now, guys. This is really it. The final stretch of this project. After a couple of hiatuses, breaks, and even some personal life issues, I'm glad to finally share this video to you. All I can say is, thank you. Thank you so much for supporting me and sticking by me to the very end. I can't really stress this enough, and I have been very good with the tags, however, I am leaving a disclaimer. This next section is probably going to have major plot spoilers, particularly through some of the movies. Also, if you're just jumping on this top 10, please note that these entries come from the first five generations. Anyway, you should all know, these Pokemon are all very special to me and I have very deep feelings for them. And I'm sure as Pokemon fans, you have your own that you hold very close to. So of course, I want to hear about them, what you love about them, your adventures with the ones you hold dear, and even maybe what you learned from them. So don't forget to leave a comment and maybe even leave a video res- Oh. Sad face. Alright, I feel bad now. Can we just cue the transition? We meet again, old friend. Well, I'm starting out the grand finale of this fireworks show with quite a blast. In fact, I pretty much got out the dynamite for this one. One of the most popular Pokemon in the Gen 3 roster, arguably the most popular legendary, and even winning the 15th anniversary as Japan's favorite mascot Pokemon. Rayquaza is definitely special to me. I have to admit, I did feel a little strange to place this Pokemon here this high on the list. Design-wise, personally, it's not really the most appealing to me. Yeah, I still like it a lot. However, it's not something alone that would place it close to my favorites. But then I just pop in a nice game that has Rayquaza as a role, and then I see it. Holy crap, this thing is awesome! Every incarnation of Rayquaza, I legitimately get excited for it. The game it's involved in could be packed to the brim with flaws, but as long as Rayquaza is there, it can fully redeem everything for me. And then there is that one movie where it had the fight scene of Rayquaza and Deoxys. Then they transitioned into a boring setting which makes it feel like a killjoy. That should say something how I feel about Rayquaza. Even with childhood memories and nostalgia aside, Rayquaza still holds out as a really good Pokemon. Out of any legendary, excluding Kyurem's forms, Mewtwo, and attack Deoxys, Rayquaza still holds to have both the highest special attack and attack power of the entire legendary roster. With both Extreme Speed and Dragon Dance to back it up makes it incredibly devastating. 
Its ability also backs it up very well, which essentially counters weather strategies. And in the context of Gen 6, this can make Rayquaza easily able to wear out the weather, which leads into its concept. Rayquaza is the master of the weather trio, and is said to live in the ozone layer for hundreds and millions of years, and would approach the Earth's surface when the two other members of the weather trio would be in conflict. Considering its role within Gen 3, and the fact that Rayquaza was based off of Z's, this was an idea that definitely didn't go to waste in execution. But my favorite incarnation comes from the first Mystery Dungeon installment. I was questioning whether to put Rayquaza in front of Reshiram, until I listened to this song you're hearing now. Hearing it for the first time in a while, I was crying. I'm dead serious. They were tears of memories. Something that the other installments don't share for me. Every time I go through Sky Tower, I just start getting flooded with beloved memories. Climbing the Sky Tower to meet Rayquaza to fulfill your role with no other options. With this type of tension, it certainly is a great experience. And people question why it's so popular. In my opinion, out of any Pokemon I've heard the title of best Pokemon ever, there really is no other more deserving than Rayquaza. It really is a spectacular Pokemon. All I can say is, thanks for the memories, and thanks for being such a great Pokemon. I'm still at the beginning of the last part, and I realize I'm going into some hot territory here. You might be one of those at the edge of your seat right now as you hear your favorite Pokemon being praised. You might be one of those who are going like, <laughs> really? Or you might be one of those who just wants to skip to the next entry because you think it's too overrated and doesn't deserve any of my acknowledgement. Um, actually I don't know where I'm going with this. Yeah, I love Lucario. Why? A lot of reasons. Well, for one, its battle capabilities are not something to mess around with. It's not really the best with its speed, and a lot of people seem to be turned off by it due to its weakness who commonly use moves, but it certainly has a hidden charm to it due to its insane move pull that can even top legendaries in this regard. Whether it be for a nice run of Pokemon Black 2, or you're just trying to find something to fill in that little hole to battle others, Lucario is just really good for that. Generally very easily accessible and enjoyable to raise, it's easy to see why people can grow attached to it quickly. We also have its concept and its design. If it's not obvious, its design most likely takes references off of Anubis from Egyptian culture. You know the story, I think that's really cool. In fact, there's not much that I don't like about its design. Lucario is an aura Pokemon that can detect other people's movements. The aura also gives Lucario the power to manipulate energy in order to make explosive spheres and release it in other forms of energy in an offensive manner. Due to the constant need of concentration, it will always stand on its toes. Lucario are also known to be rather intelligent and through the many incarnations of Lucario, they seem to be very loyal to their trainer. The method of evolving Riolu already shows that it requires a bond in itself to own a Lucario. They also seem to have a natural sense of justice, which really does say that they have a lot of humanized emotions. Then there is its role within the movie. It took place a thousand years ago before Pokeballs were invented. It told the story of the hero Sir Aaron, who was willing to sacrifice his life in order to stop a war. His student, who was a Lucario, followed him outside their kingdom. Not wanting his student to suffer the same fate, he trapped him inside his staff. Upon release, Lucario would mistaken this action as a form of betrayal from his original trainer as he would grieve it through most of the movie. However, at the Tree of Life, Lucario was faced with an obstacle where Mew was losing its power once again. Willing to make his own sacrifice, he used his power of aura in order to save the Mew. During his death, he saw a recording of Sir Aaron, which showed his original intent and in how Lucario was now suffering the same fate. Seeing this, there was a sudden wave of emotions that went onto Lucario and there was no regret. Seeing these human-like emotions and his strong bond to his trainers was really powerful in my eyes. And it really makes me think a Pokemon can really feel this. 
So I guess we have the age-old question. Is it overrated? Well, I'm going to leave that entirely up to you. A Pokemon that was hyped up before Gen 4 was even introduced, and game for delivering with a great concept, design, battle capabilities, and a great role in the movie. Also the fact that I hardly hear people actually argue it's the best Pokemon ever, and instead only claiming it as their favorite. I honestly can't really think its overrated title is appropriate anymore. And I understand it's an either love or hate Pokemon, but honestly, I do feel it's hated for all the wrong reasons. Lesson of the day, none of this matters, love what you love. Oh, you know right from that cry that this Pokemon is clearly a badass. The moment I saw this while browsing Gen 5 Pokemon, I was like, I want one of those. Little did my tiny head know at the time that this thing was broken. In fact, I'm so cocky of having a top tier Pokemon right from the get go, I decided to represent it with a legendary Pokemon theme. It's just that good. All fear the power of its stat distribution that works perfectly with its typing its abilities, and its move pool. It's not going to give anything a second chance. Uh, uh, you know, on second thought, I should actually calm down and fully explain in a much more logical manner. Its commonly known capability is to set up a sword dance and simply sweep within the sandstorm. It might get nerfed from Gen 6, but eh, a bite. Exedril also has one of the coolest designs in the Pokemon roster. You know what? Forget what I said about Luxray. Exedril is a giant mole with two large metal Wolverine claws and a steel helmet to protect its head from underground cave-ins. And those large metal claws aren't just there to compensate. Exedril can straighten its entire body in order to form a giant spinning drill which can even cut through metal. This is one of the few things where I actually find power overwhelming to legitimately be exciting. Because for one, it's creative. Two, it's awesome. It's creatively awesome. And despite Exedril being enough of a badass as it is, there is Iris's Exedril. Now, I'm not sure if I present a popular viewpoint on this, but I love Iris's Exedril. Out of any anime incarnation of any Pokemon, Iris' Exedrill falls very close into my favorites. Let me put it this way, Piplup makes me forget about Dom. Exedrill, on the other hand, makes me care about Iris. It's not something I can fully explain in a ridiculous amount of detail, but I'll try to keep it brief so you get the gist of it. The role that Exedrill served was a childhood companion which Iris saved as a drill. Since then, they've been partners to the very end. They would win many fights and they were excited to win their 100th streak, which happened to be the Dragon Master Drayden in which they lost. Ashamed, it curled up into a drill and refused to fight. Throughout the series, its part was about overcoming the fear of the thought of losing. And unlike a number of Pokemon within this series, it was about both Iris and Exedrill. And that rematch with Drayden just made me love it even more. Now. I won't be the first to admit that Iris isn't the most compelling character, but it's one I felt was both interesting, yet at the same time, make it entertaining to watch. And I'll definitely take it for what it is. So Exedrill is quite simply put, a Pokemon that exceeded my expectations, and it still holds up as one of my favorites. 12 out of 10, need one now. Now Zoroark is a Pokemon that seems to be getting a large amount of popularity, and it's not too hard to see why. Its sweeping capabilities are absolutely monstrous, putting quite literally all its base stat total into its attack, special attack, and speed makes it something that can take out the vast majority of the Pokemon roster if it had a chance. It can also learn a couple of moves that might possibly get your team out of a bind. So you're probably wondering, isn't this the standard for fast Pokemon? Well, you're right on that statement. But Zoroark's saving grace lies within its ability, Illusion. 
It makes it so when you send out a Zoroark, it will assume the form of the Pokemon that is last in your team until it gets hit. This makes your foe unaware what's to come, whether it's to switch out items with Trick, Sucker Punch, or even Nasty Plot to complement its already good special attack. A good Zoroark user will make sure that you will be pissed off during the match. It also has the strongest Dark-type move and its signature move, Night Days where it sends out a shockwave at its targets with a 40% chance of lowering accuracy. It's not the most special move, nor is it the most impressive, but it looks damn cool in the anime, so I'll excuse it. Zoroark's design is obviously close to Anthropomorphic Kitsune. Unlike other familiar Anthro Pokemon, Zoroark goes closer to Feral with the way it runs and the structure of its legs, making it more of a wear. And then there is its concept. Since it has the illusion ability, it's most likely based off of Kitsune Legends, much like Ninetales and the now Fennekin. The markings on its eyes and its mouth also indicates that it takes inspirations off of theater makeup from either Kabuki or No, which is also appropriate due to Zorua's role within Best Wishes. It can also create any illusion to deceive its opponent, though it usually uses it to defend its pack, even if they're not the same species, which brings its role within the movie in which Zoroark took the role of a mother who did whatever it took to protect her young one. Now, unlike most movies within the series, this Pokemon expressed all emotions through gestures and actions. The emotions you can interpret and how Zoroark went through great lengths in order to defend her son was quite fascinating to me. There is also N Zoroark. Oh wait, you mean that Zoroark who appeared for about 5 seconds in both games? Yes, that Zoroark. Despite the small appearance, we can get quite a lot from this. So we do know from Pokemon Black and White, as well as its sequels, that N definitely has some sort of relation to this Pokemon. Game Freak never straight up and told us the whole story, so it's mainly there for us to interpret. And that's not something new with Game Freak. But this is what I gathered. So we know about N, a person with strong beliefs that Pokemon should be free. He's kind of the quiet type, and he can talk to Pokemon. We also know that he was raised in the woods by Pokemon until Getsis claimed him as his son. Well, you know how it goes. Like father, like son. But Getsis is so cruel, and N, though was picking sides only because he felt it was right, is very kind. I honestly can't see Getsis raising such a person. Considering Zoroark's overall behavior that I went over, we certainly can make links to N's personality. So, what I think is that the Zoroark we see here was working undercover, as a sort of second father. Not a genetic father, of course but as a close friend that was close by him. Alright, I know it's not much more evidence to this claim, but we also have the claw markings that happen to be on the skateboard found in his room. I know it might sound a little far-fetched to a couple of you, but this is the way I see Zoroark. He's a hidden father figure that one could go to when they are feeling down in life and in need of the support. I see Zoroark as a very caring Pokemon, willing to try to help those in need without trying to hurt others. If you knew anything about me, then you probably saw this coming. I'm sure you weren't exactly certain where, but it was coming regardless. So earlier in this huge list, I kind of described Lugia as sort of being the ocarina of time of Pokemon. Well, if Ho-Oh is the counterpart and they are indeed a duo, I might as well describe it as the Majora's Mask. Not a Pokemon for everyone, not nearly as successful, has a different sense of quality, and damn is its fanbase passionate about it. I myself am included. Despite not having any huge roles within games or anime, there is a special charm when it comes to ho -Oh. Well, for one, it's a Pokemon that appears in the title of the main series games. You know its capabilities are monstrous. This Pokemon is also part of the original duo, with Lugia being its counterpart. So like a typical duo, the base stat total is the same with a switch of stats added in somewhere. In Ho-Oh's case, the attack and defense stats are switched, giving Ho-Oh the offensive capability while still maintaining the same special defense as Lugia. Despite what people may think and the fact that Gen 4 fixed this, this is a devastating combination that can prevent easy setups and tank like crazy. 
And with its ability regenerator, Ho-Oh basically says, Stealth Rocks? Ha! And for those who are wondering who would win in a fight against these two, well, as someone who's a little more into the competitive side, I've still made it the situation of Ho-Oh versus Lugia quite a number of times. They're kind of like magnets repelling off each other. But of course, much like the other Pokemon, the battle capabilities are something I leave as a nice icing on the cake, and is more of the exterior of the analysis. So what else is there? Well, I'm not being around the bush. A major part of why it's here is nostalgia purposes. Ho-Oh was the first legendary I've ever caught. Well, it might have been Mewtwo, but if that was the case, I don't remember, so I deem it a forgettable experience. Ho-Oh, on the other hand, plowed through a lot of the Elite Four for me, and it allowed me to dodge that thing that prevented me to get into RPGs, known as grinding. After that, I felt very accomplished seeing those credits roll. Instead of running around in circles, I went on an optional detour to catch and use my reward. It kind of felt more like a Zelda game in that manner to me. This event alone got me a lot more into the RPG genre of video games. And when I saw it on the cover of Heart Gold and the title screen, I was hyped. And what did I get? An amount of backstory to back up ho -Oh's appearance within the game, and my god, that theme song. It also has a beautiful design and taking references off of phoenixes, and completing the symbolism which the legendary beast gave, symbolizing the rebirth of all, and serving as the Grand Master of the Three. Just all those connections to Pokemon lore, it's, it's just freaking awesome. It's also said that whoever encounters a Ho-Oh is guaranteed internal happiness. And to top it all off, it poops rainbows. What more could you ask for? So, it's got the memories, it's got the beauty, it's powerful, and it certainly has heart. It really doesn't deserve any less than this placing. It's no question, you guys know I love grass types. Mostly all my analysis with these things is me gushing over the type. Uh, yeah, grass type is my favorite, if you haven't figured it out already. But no grass type describes why I love these little things more than the snivy line. Well, the first thing I should probably acknowledge is that Superior is not a great battle, at least not on the competitive traits. But to those who take a little too much time to think that's the only thing about a starter and want to constantly hound how your favorite is better, I just need to say this. Why does that even matter? What's important to me in a starter is to keep momentum going in your playthrough while giving you enough options to work with. And does Superior take the cake when it comes to this? Unlike any other starter, with every incarnation of a Gen 5 game and I pick Snivy, Never did I regret a single thing. As opposed to other games that I found the starter to either get too boring or frustrating at other points, the Snivy line ensured me a smooth run all the way through with a considerable difficulty curve that went along with it. The move pull takes a combination of support-based moves, offensive moves, and stat-raising moves to make up for its mediocre attacking stats, making it useful for pretty much any team you want to form up. Yeah, okay, this segment is sounding a little familiar. That's because I feel Superior is pretty much Meganium 2.0, and I'm probably not too far off. But instead of being bulky, it's more speedy, making you think in a different way. That's just very enjoyable. So it's pretty fun to use in combat and all, but what else do we have? Well first, that design. I have to say, this is probably one of few Pokemon that I legitimately cared for every single stage of its evolutionary line. Snivy has a nice slender build, Servine looks loyal and elegant, and Superior looks like he has a lot of class. This was one evolutionary line where I looked forward to knowing that each one was going to be in the front lines through all my playthroughs. And the amount of cultural links is absolutely astounding. But since it was confirmed by Ken Sugimori, it links and was highly inspired off of French loyalty, which probably explains Superior's royal look. But with how many things this evolutionary line can link to, I can probably keep you for a few more minutes, explaining the possibilities. But I don't want to do that, so I'll go over my favorite one. As I mentioned in the previous list, the line shares an interesting concept. 
As it evolves, it begins to start losing its arms and legs. In some myths, snakes used to be dragons, and the line represents losing the arms and legs and forming what we know as snakes. This is more apparent since Superior can learn an array of Dragon-type moves from via Move Tutor, as well as its hidden ability, Contrary, which translates into Devil's Advocate. Uh, you know, sometimes I actually feel Snivy's line is a little unappreciated, since its fans have the tendency to whine about non-existent popularity. This started to me just feel sort of fresh and original, and it quickly did turn into my favorite all-time starter to choose. It really is a great Pokemon. Also, Game Freak, please release Contrary, it's overdue. So we are approaching very close to the end. And like all good things, time needs to take its course. The next entry is definitely a very personal preference for me. But I don't think I can put it any more bluntly than this. Rayquaza has just been kicked in the balls. Boy, even after my segment with the popular Giratina, I really did just put Dialga as my all-time favorite of the creation trio, and even my all-time favorite mascot Pokemon. Well, Dialga just has everything I could hope for in a gargantuan legendary, and I think it's finally time it gets some proper justice within a community that doesn't seem to talk about it too often. The battle capabilities, everything works great as you expect. The stats aren't much different from its counterpart, but the typing is exactly what separates it from Palkia to being more defensive. With a typing that has still yet to be replicated to this date, it gives Dialga resistance to half the entire meta. Not even the Dragon-type nerf is going to stop it since Steel has been given an advantage over Tinkerbell types. It doesn't even stop there. In my opinion, Dialga is the most versatile Uber. With a move pull too big to fit on screen, access to support, setup, attacking, tanking, just about anything that you can dream out of the meta, Dialga has it. Design-wise, it also has what I love about a steel type. It has the trend of what I like to call artificially supernatural. What I mean by that is that it takes inspiration off of human-made objects and then turns it into a deity. Dialga is a blue sauropod dinosaur with metallic structures that resembles different forms of clocks. It's also got its diamonds obviously contrasting with its pearl counterpart and also probably going with its steel typing due to how tough Diamond is known to be. And of course, there's its concept. Yes, I did intentionally hold it off from Palkia until we got to the end of the list. But the two are most likely based off of Shinto legend of Izinami and Izagami, two entities that were said to make an island using a spear. That's also how we got the name of the location, Spear Pillar. Dialga also being the temporal Pokemon manages all time. Even later Pokédex entries suggest that Dialga's heart beats like a clock. And with all of this, I still haven't mentioned its role within Pokémon Mystery Dungeon 2. Well, it's kind of like Rayquaza, except better. Even if you have no knowledge of this song that's playing, you're probably still pumped up just by listening to it. Primal Dialga's theme, right when I heard it, became one of my favorite Pokémon themes, and even boss themes in general. And with the Pokémon you grow a connection to and their lives on the line, a destined, unlivable future that you've already experienced. And let's not forget... <laughs> Favorite 4th Gen Legend...
Behold, my favorite fifth gen Pokemon and the only pony you'll ever see in my room, Keldeo. Keldeo is a Pokemon that does have quite a lot of defining elements that give a large sense of uniqueness when compared to most legendaries. It's the first Pokemon to be the fourth member of a legendary group, its typing still remains unique, only Poliwrath competing with it, the only Pokemon besides Meleta that learns their signature move outside the event you get it from, and unlike most legendary groups, it has quite a lot of trivial aspects that differentiate Keldeo from the other three. The use in battle is really no surprise. Standard special attack sweeping, simple yet effective. However, due to its typing that you won't see anywhere else, and it fights alongside its signature move which basically works like a fighting type size shock, Keldeo is an unexpected fighter. When it's out and has potential to outrun your Pokemon, you'll need something to resist a strong fighting physical move and high amounts of special based water attacks. Yeah, doesn't sound too easy, does it? Design-wise is also something I take quite a liking to. Just one of those things that is simple enough, but it's very effective. I will admit, I am a sucker for equines, but the light blue around its neck and tail with that cream-colored body just works for me. And in the resolute form, its hair now takes the form of a feathered hat, and the hooves look like they suddenly belong on a noble knight. So great Pokémon just from the outer layer. But what really gets it this high is the sheer concept of it. Given its typing and its ability to walk across water, Keldeo most likely takes inspirations off of Kelpie horses. However, being the fourth member of the Musketeer Quartet, Keldeo most likely represents Dark Tanyan, the fourth member of the Three Musketeers, and also the one who is known to have the most potential of all. And there's a lot to Keldeo linking to that. The Lornsa of Keldeo had generally stronger moves than the other three, yet they were learned at a higher level. It has the weakest attack of all four, However, it's got a signature move, Secret Sword, which complements the title of the Fighting-type Pokémon with the highest base special attack power. Secret Sword is known to be the strongest of all swords, but the reasons aren't for brute strength. No. It's Keldeo taking the knowledge from all the other members of the Musketeers, what essentially is the Triforce of the Pokémon world representing wisdom, courage, and power. Keldeo takes all those elements and demonstrates true power. All of this was represented in the movie Keldeo was in and even more. Keldeo starts off as cocky and overly confident, which later causes the Swords of Justice to be contained in ice created by Kira. Throughout the movie, he discovered the importance of companions through both Iris and Silent. Upon confronting Kira again, he realized his inner strength and what truly made it. His friends that are always with him. That fear didn't just go away. It became a driving force that represented a strong sense of courage. And in the end, he sacrificed his victory to protect his friends. To me, in terms of heart, Keldeo really is the strongest Pokémon I've ever seen. Not measuring any statistics, I'm talking about inner strength. And there really is a lot you can take from this, because I feel everyone does have the potential to share this same heart. Learning from others is what truly makes you strong. People around you care about you and your goals, and you shouldn't take it for granted. Fear is only a means to courage. And of course, know your potential, set a goal to it, but work beyond it. Eat your heart out, Ed. You are now a man. It's so beautiful. So, I kind of have to come clean with everyone on this entry. There was only one reason that Shaman got higher than Keldeo. Statistically pretty much having the same capabilities, but just a bit better, a predictable yet tough to avoid strategy, a design I love, and a concept that just wins it for me, there is an element that I just simply favor more. Can you take a guess? Go on, just take a wild guess. Didn't figure it out? Well, my favorite type is Grass. My second favorite is Flying. But with that aside, there certainly is a lot for me to talk about this Pokémon. First, its capabilities. Not to sound like a broken record on my previous segment, but Shaman has a similar purpose of special attack sweeping. In Skyform, it gains a speed stat of 127, 
that's even quicker than Darkrai and Weavile. It also gains 120 base special attack and Serene Grace to complement its already powerful Seed Flare. Seed Flare is also one of my favorite signature moves in the entire roster. What it does is gather all the pollutants around itself and stores it as energy through photosynthesis. After it's all gathered, it releases all of the energy which literally explodes into clean air. From the Shockwave, it has 120 special power, a 80% chance of lowering special defense with Serene Grace, and absolutely no drawbacks. Combine this with access to Earth Power and Air Slash makes it predictable, but deadly. I guess I should go over the landform as well. Well, to put it simply, it's arguably the weakest of all the 100 across the board counterparts, basically working as a poor man Celebi with the same variety of support moves. But do you know what? I'm fine with that. It's weaker, but it's basically two Pokemon in the same pack, giving a boatload of options to use it for. I would say that does excuse it. Shaman also probably marks as very close to one of my favorite designs in the entire roster. And I'm talking about both forms. The land form resembles a small hedgehog, but instead on its back, it forms what appears to be a bouquet of flowers. When it turns into Sky Shaman, it takes the appearance of a small reindeer. It also gains a flower petal that resembles something like a scarf, which leads into its concept. Shaman is known as the Gratitude Pokemon. And as far as any other title of any other Pokemon claim to illustrate a concept, none of them have executed it as well as Shaman. So Gratitude is described as giving and returning. Within Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Explorers of Sky, you could give gifts to friends who also have the game within the secret village. It also shows due to how it changes forms. In land, it's a bouquet of flowers and symbolizes a gift. Then when it's day and touched by a Gracidia, it becomes a messenger of the sky, soaring across the land and delivering gifts to loved ones far away, saying that despite us parting ways, we're still special to each other and we'll never forget that. It also has its story from the flower town from Gen 4. It was said that the town used to be barren, but one day, somebody gave it blessing and thanks to the land. Afterwards, it grew flowers. It's saying that being grateful for what you have allows you to see the world's inner beauty. And then there is its role within the movie as well. Alright, you're not going to like this. But I like Shaman. It showed a sign of friendship to the one it was nice to. And it was annoying to the one that found it annoying. It symbolizes a reflection of your attitude towards others. If you view someone as being nice to you, then chances are you're a nice person. If you think everyone is against and cruel to you, chances are you're probably just as guilty as you're accusing of everyone else. Then it gave a good portion of its energy in order to save Giratina. Once energetic, and now spreading a huge thank you for everyone and powerful enough to save a Pokemon. It is an interpretive character, and I will admit it's not the most compelling. But for what it is, I like it. Shaman doesn't just have a spectacular concept. It's one that I can equate my own life to, and also one I feel others can easily learn from. It's simply a Pokemon I can look at and smile. I was actually considering this Pokemon to be my absolute favorite, but it's not. There is one Pokemon I do feel stronger for, so what is it? Alright, this is it everyone. In order to be my favorite Pokemon of all time, I have to like its design, its capabilities, its concept, and its role as a character. This is really it. My favorite Pokemon of all time is Grobile. Protect the sunrise for everyone's sake.
I think most of you have come to expect this pick, mainly through process of elimination. But if I did surprise any of you, well, that's good. This is a feeling I've been holding back for a very, very long time, but I finally get to talk about it. Well, its statistics won't get you anywhere because it's not fully evolved, but there are some things worth mentioning in order to make room for its final stage, Sceptile. Its offensive move pool is enormous. It even competes with grass legendaries in that field. And remember, this is just a starter Pokemon, which is impressive. It also has its hidden ability Unburden, which doubles its speed when it consumes its held item, which gives you a massive amount of attacking options. We also have that design. It has a really defined look that just makes it stick out. I think it's mainly due to the forest green color, which I really like. It also has leaves that are on its wrists, back, and head, allowing it for camouflage. The leaves also retract into blades, giving it used to be signature move, Leaf Blade. Forget about grass types being cute and elegant, Grovi is just plain flat out cool. The line itself is also how I got into grass type Pokemon. At a time where I got bored of always choosing fire, I gave Trico a shot. It was one of those first time experiences that made me so excited to play Pokemon. And though it's not my favorite to pick, the very joyful memories will always be there. But of course, you all know it. The real reason why it's here is not any of this. It's the role within Pokemon Mystery Dungeon, Explorers of Sky. So within the story, at the end of an expedition, you hear word that the time gears were being stolen, which was having an effect on time. Later on, you would figure out it was none other than Grovile. Dust Neuer reveals that Grovile is a Pokemon that came from the future as an outlaw in order to escape a bounty and would cause the future's paralysis. In an attempt to prevent this, the main character helps Dust Neuer in a plan to lure him and capture him in a trap. Successful, Dust Neuer planned on taking Grovile back into the futures and set the time gears back where they belong. But then, in the same process, he dragged both you and your partner into the future. Trapped in the future, you see a realization. The fate of the world. Thinking that you actually prevented this, the world's paralysis was a reality. No trees grew. Water doesn't flow. The sun never rose. A truly unlivable environment. Dust Neuer was then revealed to be the main antagonist of the game, as well as Grovile's real intentions. Grovile wanted to save the future of the world from the already enraged Dialga within the past. It was also revealed that you were the partner who wanted to help Grovile save the future. Dust Neuer didn't want any of this. Because if history was changed, then all the inhabitants of the future would disappear, which included himself, Grovile, and even you. So Grovile, you, and your partner were able to get back to the present time with Celebi's power. And once again, Grovile stole the time gears in order to return them to Dialga to stop its rampage. However, due to Dust Neuer still teamed up with the enraged primal Dialga of the future, was able to enter in another time hole and catch the group within the trap. From a surprise attack, you, the hero, take a blow where Dust Neuer intended to finish you off. But Grovile defended you and with his last breath, dragged Dust Neuer right back into the future. He was willing to sacrifice everything to save the future the land he loved, his beloved partner, and even his very existence. But those heroic actions don't even stop there. In the special episode, In the Future of Darkness, you play as Grovile who is forced to form a temporary truce with Dust Neuer in order to stop Dialga's new henchmen and preserve the safety of the hero in the present. Later when trying to save Celebi, Dust Neuer saved Grovile by pushing him away from falling debris. As he was recovering, he asked a question. Grovile, why do you fight so hard like this? You say you fight for new life, but if you do, you'll disappear. Your existence will end. For me, I cannot bear that idea. To make myself disappear, I cannot allow it. With all that said, why do you fight so hard to such a goal? With that, he answered. Dust Neuer, I understand you don't want to disappear, but me... This is what I think. Even if I were to disappear, I wouldn't truly disappear. Everything ends eventually. Even if I disappear, even if history is left unchanged, even if the world of darkness continues in its current state, eventually, the day would come when I won't be here anymore. Since that's the case, 
the timing doesn't matter. The important thing is not how long you live, but it's what you live for. While I live, I want my life to shine. I want to prove that I exist. If I could do something really important, that would definitely carry on into the future. Not just my future, or everyone's future. In them, my spirit is alive. And that spirit can be passed along to others. So even if I disappear, everything I accomplish will go on. That would mean it is living, right? Those words sunk really deep, but even more so at the event where Dustin Oyer betrayed Grovile as his life was endangered. But even with his dying breath, he told Dustin Oyer, despite his action, that he still trusted him, that he could sense there was good. It was only the desire to not disappear that causes him to pick the Alga's side. But choosing to extend your life in sacrifice of what you could do, is there any happiness in a life like that? What does it mean to live? Grovile's words got to Dustmoyer, and he saved him, as well as redeeming his entire life. Then the aurora appeared as time was going back to its original state. The wind was blowing, and the sun was rising. All the accomplishments could be seen right in front of them. The beautiful world that can be seen for such a short burst of time, and leave your heart with so much happiness as you part with the world itself. Never have I seen a fictional character demonstrate this type of development and get so deep. Even though it was fictional, it felt so... real. Like this is the type of stuff that can happen in reality. I really have learned a lot from Grovile. To embrace the beauty this world has to offer. To never give up on the goals no matter what tries to stop you. Letting go of all fear to do what you feel is right. The belief that there are no bad people, only bad judgment, and to treat those people as misguided companions. What it means to live. While I live, I want my life to shine. There's a flame that truly burns in everyone's heart. Some choose to keep it reserved to extend their life. But me, I want it to shine as bright as it possibly can. I want to make a name for myself and make that passion shine from a mountain for everyone to see and it will burn so bright that nobody can ever extinguish it. I have a revelation for my ideal of a utopia. If I can do something that I'm proud of, I truly will find eternal happiness. And when I get wrapped up in lights taking me to the next life, I can look down at everyone and truly see that I did make a difference and someone will pass my legacy onto the next generation. This is why Grovile is my favorite Pokemon. He's believable, life-changing, and lasting. He's a hero. My hero. My irreplaceable partner. I'll always remember you, Grovile. Your life really did shine.